Hi everyone, my name is Lindsay Quinlan and I work in the Unowned Cat Team here at International Cat Care. Um, and today we're going to be talking about all things volunteering. One of the things that we wanted to recognize is the enormous contribution that volunteers make to helping improve the welfare of cats, particularly unowned cats all over the world. And really volunteers add value to all aspects of our work, both frontline and behind the scenes. So things like organizations being run entirely by volunteers, where all roles are colored, covered on a voluntary basis, to organizations with paid employees, where volunteers come in to enhance the work alongside staff, um, to vets and, and nurses who volunteer their time and their skills, neutering and vaccinating unknown cats. And of course, there's a lot of things that volunteers do that involve never touching or seeing a cat. Um, for example, they may volunteer their leadership skills or their social media skills or their fundraising skills. And while volunteers add enormous value, being a volunteer and managing volunteers uh, is often a wonderful experience, but it isn't always easy. And there are important considerations to make uh, just to make sure it goes well. Um, like positively engaging with volunteers. And I say that from my own experience of having been a volunteer working in animal welfare and also managing volunteers. So today we have the absolute pleasure of speaking with Charlotte Fielder, who really is an expert in the volunteering space. Charlotte, welcome. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. And I'm really excited. That was such a, a brilliant about all the things we're going to cover. Yes, and I could introduce you, Charlotte, but you will do a much better job than I can. So could we actually hit the ground running by you telling us a little bit more about your, yourself um, and your work that you've done with volunteers throughout your career? Okay, so um, I was one of those people who had a midlife career change because I was really passionate about working with cats and dogs. But it wasn't an easy path. Um, so I have had a, a squiggly career. I spent 33 years in law enforcement. So I'm going to roll back to 1980 and I started work and trained as a customs officer. And then I did lots of other work in different um, areas of um, government departments and ended up working for the UK Border Force. And um, but I got to about 33 years in and I realised that um, if you're in a role that sometimes is quite negative, it's all about arresting people and it's not always very fulfilling. <laughs> and there is a there is a yearning that um, if you can answer that call, then that's a really wonderful thing to do for yourself. So I became involved in a charity called Reach, which supports children uh, with upper limb deficiency or upper limb difference as we call it now so I was born with a missing hand and I thought I had an opportunity to really um, talk about the possible because there were times when I was in my job where people would you can't do that because you've got a missing hand and I was sort of yes I can and a long story short is that I ended up writing a book for them which was actually aimed at the at the parents of children and supporting them and then after that, I decided, well, this charity is really short of funds, so I'm going to raise some money for them. And without realising it, I became a volunteer fundraiser in my local community. And friends of mine wanted to get involved and they were suggesting different things we could do to raise money. But it was very organic, but it gave me the flavour for wanting to do something. And I particularly enjoyed um involving people and organizing activities and if people wanted to volunteer that was just that was the sweet spot so mm -hmm. it was a really uh, a really sort of good thing to learn so um i applied for a job um running the volunteer services at a local hospice having never worked at a charity before but um i had had uh, i'd been managing staff since um 1987 and I really understand performance management and getting the best out of people so um, I managed to get that job and I, I stayed there for two years to gain the experience that I needed 
And then I started zeroing in on animal welfare and then um, got the job of head of volunteering and fostering at, at Battersea. So that's my that's my journey there. And I, I, I thank my lucky stars every day because um, the eight years I spent at Battersea were um, the best years of my working life. And it was such a pleasure to work alongside volunteers and foster carers and staff um, and make it happen. Oh, wonderful. Thanks. And of course, to our viewers today, that's where you and I met. We were colleagues together at Battersea. We certainly were. And my recollection is um, how proud you were to tell me that you had started off your career within um, animal welfare as a volunteer. And I realised that great. is, yeah, it's great when people stay in touch um, with their with their roots so, uh, yeah, retiring from Battersea was a uh, happy sad for me. Of course. But having retired and having spent many successful years developing volunteer programs, and certainly, you know, you left an enormous impact at Battersea, you're now spending the first year of your retirement volunteering. That's right, isn't it? I am in many ways. Um Coinciding with me leaving Battersea, I stood for election to become a trustee of a UK umbrella charity, which is called um, the Association of Dogs and Cats Homes. So I was delighted to be elected um, within um, within ADCH. I am uh, doing some volunteer mentoring. I'm helping develop the uh, programme, uh, the assessment programme. So um, in terms of how we recruit volunteers to be the assessors for dogs and cats home. So um, that's really good. And I'm volunteering for Battersea as a volunteer tour guide. And I'm also, which is not so much volunteering, but it's about spreading really positive messages about cats and dogs and companion animals and animal welfare. I'm speaking on cruises. Oh, wow. The conversations we had about the cats and their cats and dogs and what they meant to them and the human animal bonds it was really uplifting i think that sounds like the dream retire and spend time on cruises talking about animal welfare <laughs> incredible charlotte um so you know as we touched on having worked with you for many years I've seen firsthand how enthusiastic you are about volunteers volunteering in general uh and I've seen you firsthand really instill a pro volunteering culture within a large organization uh I mean you you are the greatest volunteer advocate and ambassador and champion that I have ever seen in, in my entire life. Where does that enthusiasm come from? Oh, that's, that's such a good question. I, I believe that it is easy to be enthusiastic when you love the work you do, because every day is an opportunity to help those cats and dogs a little bit more. When I get off the train, and I'm walking towards the gates of Battersea, I'm actually saying, yes, I'm here. I'm here. And, and that's how it felt. So um, to have that real feeling of that you are going to, you know, I know a lot of us work at home now, you open your computer or you're working directly with cats mm -hmm. and actually value that opportunity because mm -hmm. so many people don't have the opportunity to pursue their dreams so I think it's important that we do practice gratitude, that we are able to work with, with cats and dogs in the first place. Um, I also have a quite a keen work ethic. And I think it's always been with me that we need to earn our wages. When you work in a ch charity, everything you do, you are spending donor money. There are people out there opening up um, you know, a, a monthly standing order or just making donations over the phone and um, I spend their money wisely. So that also gave me sort of a keen interest in, in what are we doing? If a, if a member of the public says, you know, I donated £100 or $100 last month, could I say how that money is going to help um, run our volunteer community? So 
when I was a senior manager at Battersea, um, I was leading the programme across three three sites and also fostering. And I became very aware that our volunteers were working side by side with paid staff. And we needed, and often doing a very similar or the same thing, and we needed to value that volunteer contribution because paid work and voluntary work are both the same. They're both they're both work. Mm. So we needed to get everybody on board. And if you are working as a professional volunteer manager, then you want to set the bar high mm. and you want to connect everybody, your staff and volunteers, to the course. And then it becomes a it it, it it's like a, a spider's web. It all joins up. There's so much connectivity. So I, I would then say to people I was working with, if we want to connect people to the cause, we need to just keep on asking the why question. So why does this matter? Mm. Why are we doing this? And if you ask why enough times, you actually bring yourself back to the cause. And that is something that we can all do with working alongside volunteers, with paid staff. And that builds real enthusiasm. Everybody mm. is on the same page we want to do our best for for cats and dogs yeah you did that I mean I definitely would see that just in even in meet you know in meetings or you know you would just give the reminder of sometimes is something as simple as why we why we need our volunteers and and what they what they give to us and for us and also how we can serve them to get to get the best out of them um you are you know you were a constant champion of the volunteer um keeping on the theme of enthusiasm when we were exchanging mm. emails to set up this call yeah uh i wrote to you that we were keen to hear your perspective on how organizations can best work with volunteers so that um i said so that everyone wins mm -hmm. specifically the organization staff volunteers and of course cats and the concept of everyone winning really resonated with you. Uh, can you tell us more about that? Um, okay, so you've referenced organisation staff, volunteers and cats. So imagine, imagine a car and that car's got four wheels. One wheel is the organisation, one is your staff, one's volunteers, one's your cat. For that car to run efficiently and to get you to where you want to be, all of those tyres need to be well maintained and inflated because if you've got a flat tyre, you're, um, you're not going anywhere. But we need to invest our efforts equally in all of those components to, to get the best out. And I, I did, I really did like the fact that everybody wins. And um, when I worked at the hospice, a lot of volunteers gave their time because they wanted to say thank you because the hospice had cared for a close family member or a close friend. And they felt it was their gift of time was to pay back that, uh, that debt. Um, when working with volunteers who work with animals, it's really different because the, the, the reason people want to get involved is because of a lifelong love of, of cats it's just something in them and something they recognize that um, cats and dogs like children don't have a voice so being able to speak for those animals and do for those animals becomes part of that um, mindset that when I do that this animal has a great chance this animal will win this animal will go to their forever home this cat will find their foster carer so I think it is um, it's a really good idea that we do our best to get to that point wherever we want to be. And if that feels like winning, I think that's a, that's really good because the opposite of that is we're losing, you know, so it's <laughs> it's about having that that mindset. And many of our, our listeners will be volunteering in organizations that are entirely made up of volunteers. So all the wheels on the car will be volunteer wheels. Um, or they might be individuals working um, largely independently as well. For example, managing a local colony of, of street cats. 
from all your years of experience and um, your wisdom gained, because Charlotte, you are very wise, what would be your advice to these individuals? Okay. Um, this is a really big question because we have to honour the contribution that is made by people who are um, working on their own. So first of all, I think it's a big shout out and a big, huge, big thank you because they are at the front line of feline welfare. Um, and it's not easy. People have to dig really deep. So, um, but I think before I, I get to the nub of your question, I just need to sort of feed a little bit more into that. Um, and that's still around getting it right for our people. So if if we work for organisations where people are coming into a centre, it's a much easier thing to do because they are there um but we also have to acknowledge that all of our volunteers are uniquely different with different life experiences with different needs uh, they are real people our volunteers don't come from central casting um we must respect them um and in the same way as we must respect our staff even people when we have got even people when they're working on their own are still part of that team and so we need to instill that the team membership with them and we need to involve those volunteers at every opportunities and that means that our communications have to be even better for people who are working um on their own and we have to um treat those communications as a two-way process our volunteers are not our audience they are people who are working with us who need to have those honest true um communications so there are a few things that always come to mind when we are looking at how we engage with our volunteers and one of them and this even goes back to another probably example of winning is there is an african saying that it takes the whole village mm -hmm. to raise a child and i i sort of turned that into um another way of looking at it and it takes a, a whole organization to support volunteering, whether or not that is at a centre or out in the streets. And the other is that old, old Greek philosopher whose name I've forgotten about the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you may have people who are very geographically spread, but they are still as important as volunteers who are coming into any centres. And it's the it's a responsibility of the um, organisation to pay particular attention to their needs. So um, we know our volunteers make a difference every single day. But if we have volunteers who are working in those real roles, trap, neuter and release, being part of that, we have to really think about um, their welfare and their well-being. So I think there's something around the importance of self-care and helping volunteers look after themselves mentally and physically, because wearing yourself out is not a badge of honour. So, it's, um, But because when you're invested in feline welfare, it's just everything. I think as responsible employers, we have um, we have to get the message across that you cannot pour from an empty jug. And then, of course, we have so many organisations where it's entirely volunteer led. And again, it's about kindness and really putting across um, the need to be kind to ourselves. And then we can do more for um, for our cats and for each other. So I, I hope that gets to answers your question. I love what you said about um we do need to look after ourselves and we need to look after each other to ensure other people are looking after themselves because so often, you know, in our line of work, the problem, the, the, the problem is just so much bigger <laughs> than what one person, one person's contribution. And I think uh, sometimes people can get unintentionally stuck in, in giving way too much of themselves to the point that they can become, you know, even make themselves ill, they're working so much. So oh, that resonates. Compassion fatigue is real. And organizations and individuals need to be on the lookout for it, for signs in themselves and others. So this is why I talk about being kind to ourselves. And it should actually be 
it should be an organisation and a personal objective. Um, a good definition, because sometimes when we talk about being kind, it's not about giving somebody a Christmas present or, you know, it's, it's, more, it's more about really understanding where they are. Mm. And a, an organisational definition of kindness is thoughtful action. Mm. And it's and it's really around organisations and staff and volunteers actually thinking about what does what does kind what does self kindness look like and what does kindness to to others how can we actually then embrace kindness and use that as as a as as a superpower. Switching switching course a little bit here. In my experience, from having both volunteered in and been employed by animal welfare organizations, um, I found that they can, you know, at times unintentionally get a bit stuck potentially in one of two categories. Um, On the one end of the spectrum is being perhaps a bit too heavy handed and dogmatic in their approach to volunteer management, Uh, perhaps unintentionally given giving volunteers the impression that uh, you know, they're expendable or they should maybe just come in and do what they're told and 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 then leave. Or conversely, at the other end of the spectrum, you know, a feeling of almost being afraid to manage volunteers for fear that this wonderful free resource, and I say free in quotations, will 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 leave. Um, and obviously not neither is an, a good situation to be in. Um, what are your thoughts on this? And most importantly, what can we do to strike the right balance? Oh, that's such a deep question. It's a really good question. And it contains uncomfortable truths because we don't live in a perfect world and we don't have perfect people and and we're all very messy individuals and we have stuff going on in our lives. And um, all of all of the things that you explained, I think, are in the mix. They they do happen. So, volunteer management, working with volunteers, is like a tightrope. So, if you can stay on the tightrope, great. But occasionally, you're gonna you're gonna fall off it. So, there are times when a certain style of volunteer management is definitely required. So, uh, the example I would give: if a volunteer um, ignores quite a reasonable request. And, you know, might say something along the lines of, you can't tell me to do that, I'm a volunteer. And then your breath is slightly taken away because you realise that they are giving their time and their talents for free. But actually, it is in that volunteer role description. And this is something that needs to be done for the, the welfare of your cats or because it's part of the teamwork. Then I think we need to remind ourselves is that one um we wouldn't allow a staff member to get away with that. You turn around to somebody and that's in your job description and, and can you do that? Oh, no, no, I, I can't do that. So we really have to be fair to our staff as well as our volunteers. By um, We can absolutely flex when we have to, but we can't always just flex just because somebody didn't want to do something. Mm-hmm. Or where I find um, is often causes us the most stress as volunteer managers is where there has been um, personality conflict, conflicts or even, and there has been um, differences of opinions and emotions are high, and then it can be very difficult. So I think for my advice for um, any organisation is to have a really robust problem-solving policy mm-hmm. and to have a look at, at the mechanics of that which enables you to bring people together to talk about what it is that's going wrong in a very reasonable and measured way. And also, once you have that problem-solving policy, is really that your problem-solving policy reflects your organisational values. So it means when you're talking to a volunteer who has done something that you feel that they shouldn't have done, instead of talking about you did this, you did that, is actually then reflect the value. So it, it's not it's not about demonising a person. It's about saying, actually, this is what we want you to do. So to have more constructive conversations, mm. which allow people the chance to make mistakes and then come back and say, OK, I won't do that again. Because you touched upon volunteers being valuable resources. They are. It 
it, volunteers are not free. If you add in together all of the hours, um, the, the people hours of your volunteer team or the people managing them and the staff working in the cater categories, if we have um, volunteers leaving too quickly and our cycle of recruitment is really small, all you're doing is getting caught in this sort of loop of recruit, induct, train, little upset, leave. And actually, when those hiccups and upsets appear, as they will, then if we can get in there and respond with emotional intelligence, with authenticity, but actually with something with a good, good problem solving policy that allows everybody to move forward with their with their dignity intact, with maybe a lesson learned. But actually, we can then occupy that very uh, show that resilience, that ground which shows you can knock me and push me, but actually we've got this and I can actually bring all this back together. And I think that's at the heart of good volunteer management. It's very easy to spend our time saying thank you and clapping people for everything that's well done, but it takes a lot more when things are going wrong. Yeah. Yeah, that's brilliant. And I think, you know, one of the things that I saw you and your team do really well, it, it, what just reminded me of this is when you talk, we, you touched on the emotional nature of working in animal welfare. And it is emotional because we we are looking after, you know, live beings and people may not always agree on the plan for the cat or the outcome for the cat. And I think something in the vein of problem solving that you and your team did really well really well was um, roles were really clearly defined. So for example, volunteers uh, weren't necessarily in our model when we worked together, volunteers weren't necessarily part of the decision-making process, but we also acknowledged very much that they were emotionally affected by some of those decisions. And just having those um, open channels of communication and engaging with the volunteer and just respecting that, you know, they have an interest in this too, even if they're not the decision maker and making that space so that they could, you know, they could feel heard and get the information they needed. You, your team, you, you were great at that. Um, I, I think I'm not taking any credit for all of that. I think the organization was really good at it. And um, what you're saying to me, if, if I could just pin a post-it note, on the screen here what you're what you're talking about is culture the organizational culture yeah you sure. know what allows all of that good stuff to happen and and for so i'm going to speak about culture just for a couple of minutes because i think it's important if we um talk about culture and people say but what is it because it's it's sometimes so sort of nefarious but if you accept that um a definition of culture is is how what we do around here what is it like in this organization? Then that enables you to find the good things and the bad things and then bring about the cultural change. So for those who are leading and working in animal welfare charities, um, there are a couple of things that we really need to be aware of. And one of them is within any organization that the culture can only move at the speed of trust. So your staff and your volunteers, everybody has to believe in the process and have trust mm. that those who are running the organisation are want to do their best for cats and mm. that that trickles down. And there are supplementary questions as well, I think, that we can all ask ourselves and about our organisation and not be afraid to ask these questions in open groups and see what everybody thinks. So you might then say, well, how does an how does a volunteer fit in to the culture of this organization how do, how do they fit in with what we do around here and is there a way that we act as an organization that is sometimes at odds with volunteers are we saying one thing and doing another and to what extent do our volunteers appear in our volunteer in the organizational strategy so i think if we get closer to asking lots of really open questions about what we do and and then dealing with the discomfort and the things that are a bit out and oh, we shouldn't be doing that that's not right that's not honoring the relationship that type of level of honesty helps us move into something 
that I've started calling person-centered um, volunteer engagement. And I did some reading up last year and I found a, a generic sector-wide um, definition, which I'm going to, I've actually got it here. I'm going to read it out. Yes. And then I adapted it to come up with an animal welfare version, a generic sector-wide definition of volunteer engagement is that volunteer engagement is the process you follow to make sure your supporters, your volunteers, are continuously interested and engaged in your work throughout the entire life cycle of their relationship with your organisation. And it requires communication throughout the volunteering activity and even after they've gone home. So mm. that's, and I like it, it's really good. But in animal welfare, we are dealing with the stuff of life. We're dealing with neglect, sometimes abuse, mm. cats being ill, Suffering. behavior cats, 30% mm -hmm. of hand rear kittens not making it, euthanasia decisions. So our volunteer engagement in animal welfare really needs to address some of those issues. So I've I've come up with some a, a definition of it. And um I, it works for me. And when I um I talked about it when I went to ICOR last year. And so I just hope that for some of the people listening in that it might so it might work for them. So um the the the, the definition I've got um is Person-centred volunteer management within the companion animal sector is the proactive process we follow to ensure that our volunteers remain interested, engaged and supported throughout their volunteering while ensuring that we respond to individual needs when required. Person-centred volunteering considers the emotional burden carried because of the nature of our work and takes the responsibility for navigating our volunteers through difficult times. So that is really about us as volunteer management professionals, people who work for charities, being there with our volunteers. When somebody says, I've come in and this week and this particular cat has gone home, I'm really happy that he's found his forever home, but I'm a little bit sad. Is that, yeah, that's... Being, being happy, sad, that's the stuff of, of life. But what we don't want is for our volunteers to be sad, sad. And because they've come in and a, a cat they really cared for that has become ill. And we need to be actually to really get close to other people's experiences and show that empathy and walk alongside with people. You know, our audience and some of the people who will be listening to this, they're, they're spread out all, all over the world. And... Um, my, my question was actually going to be in your view, what are things we need to consider when working with volunteers across, you know, different geographical regions? And I think some of what you just said answers that question in terms of, um, you know, these really important themes that, that transcend geography, don't they? They're, they are human centered, as you said, what are your thoughts on that? And I think it's really important to consider that we are working with universal themes across geography and not become too country centric um but one size does not fit all because we also have to be culturally sensitive because what happens in one particular country in the uh, the care and the ownership of cats and um is very different to it to how it might be in other countries so we need to really think about those local needs and factor them in and for me, the, the universal themes in volunteering are often around our desires to be to be happy and fulfilled. And, and I read a really interesting quote, and it was by some Victorian, I think he was a clergyman, he was a man of the cloth. And he wrote about the, the three essential um, parts of happiness are that everybody needs to, be, to do something. And that everyone needs someone to love and someone to something to hope for. And I thought, well, how does that translate into our modern day work? And so these ingredients, if you take everyone needs something to do, well, we can say that's purpose. 
and everyone needs someone to love. Well, that can be your passion. That can be your passion for the cats you're trying to help. And something to hope for, that's your ambition. So we have our purpose, our passion and our ambition, which takes us a long way. And these these are absolutely, truly universal. Mm. But at the same time, I recognise that we're not living in a, a fridge magnet society. Mm-hmm. It's 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 much more involved than just the desire to do good or be happy. And this is where, you know, earlier on, we spoke about the importance of getting the culture right. Absolutely. We must do everything we can to understand and improve the culture of our organisations. And also, I think we really have to do a lot of work about understanding volunteer motivation wherever that is in the world, because individual motivation, they're very different. There was a study where the top two motivations might be, I care about the cause and I want to make a difference. And they're pretty sort of standard answers in volunteer surveys. But there are other motivations as well. And if we understand what they are, that enables us to really connect our volunteers more to Mm. support them. And I think there's something that we really need to understand about tasking. You know, what are we asking our volunteers to do? And um, what is the, you know, what's the impact for the organisation? Hopefully that's going to help us rehome more cats, care for more cats, neuter more cats. But actually, what impact does that have on our, volu- of our volunteers? So, yes, have some sort of high, high ideals about how we want to be happy and fulfilled but also to consider the the psychological dimensions of volunteering and make sure that we're not just ignoring something because it's in the too difficult box. Really great answer. Really thought-provoking philosophical stuff coming from you today, Charlotte. Well, it's, it's, it's from the heart. It's what I truly believe. I never say anything that I just think, oh, that sounds good. I, I, I truly believe it um, yeah. because, because the people are people are our biggest resource. They are the people who make things happen. Look after our people. And that is something that we have to do every single day. We cannot ignore looking after the people who are delivering our services. Yeah, and I was thinking back to my own motivation when I started volunteering. Um, My first job was a a volunteer dog walker. And my motivation wasn't entirely to, to, to help dogs. It was... I just moved to the to London from the US. I'd never been on public transport before in my life. Suddenly I'm living in this, you know, enormous city. And part of my motivation was to immerse myself in London life before I looked for a job, uh, you know, a paid job. People might find that motivation surprising because it wasn't just about helping helping dogs. I wanted to meet people. I wanted to learn how to take the train. I, it was Battersea happened to be on my train line. I mean, there were, uh, you know, many reasons why I ended up there that weren't just because I wanted to help the cause. And you're absolutely right. And, uh, and meeting people is one of the, is a prime motivation for people joining charities is actually meeting like-minded people yeah. or they just want to get out of what they're doing and broaden their horizons, as is getting fit. Some people want to come and volunteer in animal-facing roles because they know they're going to be cleaning a cattery pen and doing things. Um, Some people do it for their mental health. There are a whole raft of reasons why people join us. If we can understand those motivations, we stand a better chance of keeping those people because we do And getting the best out of them, absolutely. Okay, switching gears here a bit. So um, cat population projects, you know, we've talked about they happen all over the world. Um, you know, cat pop, massive over cat populations is a problem everywhere. Um, and they're often about, the projects themselves are often about setting up the capacity and the process and then leaving it in the hands of locals who are essentially volunteering their time to maintain the work. The work being, you know, monitoring the unowned cat population, potentially trap, neutering, vaccinating and returning. And the locals will often uh, participate, as I said, on a voluntary basis. And as we know in cat population management, when we take our foot off the pedal, populations can boom again. And progress that's been, you know, a lot of hard work that's gone into creating that progress can be undone very quickly. 
Um, so I wanted to ask you, what are your thoughts on sustainability in these types of, um, you know, voluntary situations? Okay, I'm, I'm going to acknowledge this, the scale of the problem. And mm -hmm. it's also important to acknowledge that the work you describe also has to be done at scale relentlessly. Mm -hmm. And that can sometimes feel really heavy, especially if for whatever reason, say COVID or um, natural disasters um, in country where um, the work has to cease and we go back in and start again. And it can be quite demoralizing because you see the impact on the uh, on on the cat um community so my my concern are probably twofold i have concerns where there's where there's one person doing something all of the time and that's around their welfare but also if you've just got one person who takes responsibility for it then it makes it harder to recruit somebody else to come in and help so in terms of wider su sustainability I think there's an area of work for us to get into here, which is really around community engagement and making the wider community within the areas where um, cat populations are a problem is to get them invested and involved. So even if they're not able to actually go and do the work, they can be the support. They could be fundraising, they could be offering storage space, they could be going out with cups of tea, whatever it is, is that one person or a small group of people never feel on their own with it. So, and it's actually, it's highlighting that work because I must say, I was at uh, the i conference last year and I listened to Vicky Halls um, give the most marvellous talk around the uh, different statuses of cats um, globally, from from the, uh, the you know the feral cat to the in betweeners, you paid attention. And, <laughs> yeah, and it was it was a it was a superb presentation because it gave everybody in in the room an idea of wow this is this is something we just have to um, really understand because of the amount the, the number of times I have a litter of, of um, kittens. So um, that why there's a wider education piece there. That's what I'm trying to say, is that to get those messages out um, in as many communities as possible and in many different ways, but also to the people who um, are unable to go out and do that work but might be able to do some micro-volunteering in terms of this is uh, um, raising that awareness, this is being done and this is how you can help. And we mm -hmm. need, just need to sort of make it a much wider thing so we all take some responsibility for managing those those cat populations by supporting the people who do it and amplifying their work. Oh, such an important point, you know, getting the community on board with helping and nobody feeling like they're doing it on because you're right, the, you know, it's, it, the problem is too big for one person to take on, to take on alone. Um, such a good point. Thank you, Charlotte. So many, our next question, many times when people, um, they want to help animals on a voluntary basis, they think of helping frontline. So physically helping a cat, and that could be going into a homing center and feeding and cleaning, for example, or going out and trapping or, you know, uh, somebody else helping with, you know, a, a veterinary professional help, helping with surgeries, for example. And this is all really, really important work. Um, but it's not all of the work and equally important is everything that happens behind the scenes. Um, I'm going to test your memory here. I once attended a talk you gave where you uh, discussed an accountant who wanted to be a driver. Can you um, explain that anecdote and why I, it was important for you to, to to bring up then? And what what is the message around the accountant who wanted to be a driver? Right. Okay. So you've already touched on the fact that um, there are many roles required within an organisation. Yeah. To make the things happen at the front line. Yeah. So it's true that when people are applying for volunteer roles, if I if when I worked at Battersea. If I needed 20 category support volunteers and that was on the website and people were invited to apply, then we would get over 100, 150, 200 people wanting those particular roles. 
And then when we used to uh, try and recruit volunteers to become fundraising event volunteers or do roles that were less popular, laundry or in the retail, that you would, those roles would be kept continually open. It's so difficult to fill them. So I think there is an importance to um, have a look at all your roles and make sure that you are talking about the how those roles contribute to the care of those cats, mm-hmm. the direct care. So if we're selling lots of things on our online shop, that's raising money, that's going to help us put people out in country doing a particular project. And mm-hmm. so each role is valued and it's not all about the people who are working directly with cats. We need all of that structure behind. But you're, you were asking me about the um, the accountant who wanted to be a driver. Mm-hmm. It was really about how sometimes when uh, we interview people for roles or somebody wants to volunteer, it's tempting to say, what did you do in your previous life? And somebody might say, I've spent 40 years as, a, as an accountant and um, these are my skill sets. I'm really great with numbers. I can make Excel sing. And straight away, somebody thinks that's great because we have a vacancy for a volunteer, um, an admin volunteer in our finance department. And that is, this is this is really what happened. And this particular volunteer, although they'd sort of almost led themselves into the role. And then I had a chat and, you know, how's it going? And he said, I just I'm just not really enjoying it. It's not for me. And uh, said, oh, you know, everybody has great feedback. You're just you just get it straight away and you're really helping organising them. He said, I spent all these years just doing numbers. And actually, I would quite like to do something for the patients. And I would really like to become a volunteer driver and go and pick people up from their homes and bring them into the um, the, 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 the hospice day centre. And that is a real piece of learning because people have got the skills and the previous experience doesn't mean that we would say, well, that's what you've got to do because people want to help in in um, very different ways. So part of us acknowledging the volunteer contribution is also acknowledging that um, not everybody is on this sort of single track and that they want to try things and do things. So, yeah, that's I'm hoping that is the example I gave you when you said you yep. want to test my memory. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Very good memory. Um, so Charlotte, you have had, you know, an excellent track record in growing a volunteer service. Uh, you did it from 2013 to 2023. Um, is there any special ingredient to your recipe for success that we haven't touched on yet in our discussion? Um, well, thank you for saying that. But I, I am going to say again, I, I was surrounded by amazing people and it was so much teamwork. My um, my speciality, if you like, is that I've always been able to motivate people, describe where we're trying to be, talk about the cause and, and get other get buy in. Um, but in terms of of. I don't think it's any special characteristics. I think having a really open mindset has always helped me. I used to have a little sign up on the wall in my office at Battersea, and it said, um, be curious rather than suspicious. Mm-hmm. Because as human beings, we can we always have a, you know, sometimes like a bit like a negative bias, isn't it? We have a feeling of of when something uh, is offered to us. Well, what do they want? What does this mean? We can sort of see things through a particular filter. Sure. Um, so being being curious about people's intentions and assuming good, assuming good intentions is actually a much better place to be. So it's sort of meeting people with that smile. And I would say to underline that would be um, giving people the benefit of the doubt. And so it's that being able to see people in a positive light Mm. and that has always helped me the most I'm so glad you said that especially about be curious because something that you probably you you may or may not know is that uh, at International Cat Care we have cat friendly principles that really guide all of our work and one of them 
is evolve for cats. And what that means is we want people to be innovative and we actually use the language remain curious. Oh, and, I didn't know. And keep learning for cats. And it's that whole curiosity and having an open mind um, that just adds so much value to, to, you know, a multitude of situations, doesn't it? I'm so glad you said that. Um. Yeah, you're right. If we always do what we've always done, we always get what we always got. You know, do things differently. Yeah. Be professionally curious. Yeah. Give people the benefit of the doubt and and have that feeling that together we can we can actually do more. And then I think that's how we we make the greater impact. But if we if it's defensiveness and and being closed that causes problems, but being prepared to get out there Allow yourself to be vulnerable. Mm. Allow yourself to be able to say, actually, I don't know. I, I've not had this experience before, but I want to learn. Let's learn together. Because nobody has the monopoly on always being right. And that's that's that to me is how is how we get on in organizations, is is really knowing where this is not my area of expertise, but I want to find out about it. Exactly. And I think just because at one point we did something one way, we we did so with the best of intentions, with the information we had at that time. And as we keep learning, then we can apply that and we can do things differently and do better. And it doesn't mean what we did is bad. It just means now we're in a position to do things better than we did before. Um, I think that's so important, both with working directly with cats and with working with, you know, volunteers, as we've been talking about. You're so right. It's that continuous improvement. In fact, I was taking some people on a tour of Battersea, London. Um, we were looking at a photograph of, of Battersea Cattery. It was a black and white photo. It could have been taken, I don't know, 60, 80 years ago. It's such an old photograph. And it showed um, crates on top of each other with cats in each one. Mm. And we'd just been in the Cattery and seen the lovely cat pens and how the cats had hidey spaces and and it was a much better environment. And the members of this tour were reflecting on this is how it used to be and this is how it is now. So always striving to make things better for our cats. But that's that's just a great way of being. And to do that, we have to make ourselves better Absolutely. and be the best we can. From all your experience working with volunteers, do you have a particular success moment or story that you'd be happy to share with us today? It's it's actually a it's a cattery example, so that's that's fits in really well. Yeah. And it's about team working and people being very honest about what they can do and what can be achieved, mm -hmm. and continuing to be honest. And and this goes back to my early years at Battersea, when a young man applied to be a cattery volunteer he had a learning disability mm -hmm. that really impacted on his ability to communicate mm -hmm. effectively but also for to, for him to be tasked and when um i received the application um, papers and also some emails from his key worker it it just looked so difficult be, and when you are a person who is as i am i, I have disability um, I have a real keen interest in diversity and inclusion. So I'm looking at this thinking this guy brings diversity to us. How can we include him? And I went um, a conversation with some staff in the cattery and uh, a cattery manager at the time. And we came up with a plan. I say we, and they were prepared to really get involved. It would mean that this guy's key worker his support worker would also have to be trained as a cattery volunteer so they were a tandem together and so that when this particular volunteer lost a bit of concentration and focus because he had difficulty in being tasked that the key worker was able to bring him back in and um, we made it happen we made it happen and this volunteer came in and he was so Apart from the fact he really loved the cats, he was so happy to be there and he was doing what he wanted to do. And um, there were challenges. Sometimes things went wrong. Of course they did. But 
but it, there was no blame attached to anything. It's like, we've got to get back in this. Let's find how we can do this. And then um, a few years later, he came to me and said, I've been accepted to do a level, you know, a level three animal welfare qualification um, at a UK college. And he went and did that qualification. And um, to me, that was a total success story. But it was because everybody, everybody cared about the cats, but everybody really cared about him and enabled him to make his contribution. So I'm I I always feel really proud of what my colleagues in the cattery did. I really and and the, the added bonus to this is this guy was so good with cats. Because if you would say you just need to sit here and let the cats come to you, don't initiate the play, don't try and pick them up, don't do this. He just sat there and you know, the, the most sort of shut down cat would just come and just sit with him. It was just perfect. It was really good. Oh, Charlotte. Yeah. I remember this individual and it, it was, it was great. You know, a really a win-win as we talked about. Yeah. Yeah. It was good. It was really good. So we I just realized we're coming towards the end of our talk. I've really enjoyed the interview. I th- you've given me so much to think about. I feel actually a bit emotional now. It yeah. still feels that, uh, that we've, we've spoken about things that are, that are, we hold really deeply. So I think that's good to be in touch with your emotions when you are working with volunteers, talking about volunteers. If anybody who is listening to this um, wants to connect with me, then I am on LinkedIn. And um, I, I always accept anybody who's got any type of animal welfare role in their, in their title. Or, so, um, and um, I do um, tweet my tag is at at charlie fielder i think by uh, the power of connection people reading other people's things and talking is is also very good for our uh, for the work we're in and for ourselves oh charlotte thank you it it's thank you it's been such an enjoyable hour that's gone by really quickly um speaking with you and um I've learned a lot and I'm sure our audience will as well. And it's been really inspiring. Um, Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, Which is all mine. I thank you. And I just send my absolute best wishes to all in iCat Care and carry on doing the fabulous work that you do and talking about that work because uh, you make such a difference to the lives of cats. Thank you. And this definitely will not be the end. We will we will definitely invite you back because you have so much to share. Thanks again. Thank Charlie. you. Thank you.